Thank you. So we're looking at this as who is the farmer in the eyes of the IRS. So this is again part of this the project. We've been invited to the IAC, IAC program discussing the meat to market program. And it has some great opportunities and some uh, very unique tax situations that we'll talk about. Our speakers, Ruby Ward was supposed to have been on board. She had some health issues uh, with her mother, so she couldn't be here. So I'm covering for today. So you've seen the four, three of us. The only one that's missing right now is Ruby. To give you some information about our organization, about 13 years ago, we created, this is the farm National Farm Income Tax Committee sat down and created the Rural Tax Education website. It's under called ruraltax.org. It's housed and hosted by Utah State University. And the goal at the point in time when we started was to develop material, educational material, for uh, farmers, ranchers that uh, for uh, tax preparation or tax purposes, tax explanations, understanding what's going on with the tax law. It's for, farming and agriculture is a very unique. There, it's one of the it has more tax code rules than uh, uh, more, majority of the others. The only ones that get close are the military and also then clergy. So there's more tax code pieces that apply to agriculture than most other businesses. So it becomes very important and uh, very complex. And our goal was to provide education. So we've, you can see under here that we've got some different material. And this is only a small snapshot of what's there. There's a lot of information when you go to the ruraltax.org website. You can use the QR code and you can Hold your phone over that and you can get into this real quickly, or you can type in ruraltax.org in your browser. And if you look at the tax topics, there is a multitude of different items written to be in layman's terms, getting away from the tax code, trying to make it understandable. So our work that we've done and are currently doing with the uh, USDA and also these types of programs comes from a grant from USDA, and you can see the number, agreement number there. But our goal is again, to help provide education. Our goal is not to be necessarily uh, reflecting the views of the Department of Ag. We are simply trying to explain the tax code, how things apply, what we need to be aware of, et cetera. So again, our goal today and with the pro project, income tax education. That's what we want to do. So looking at our agenda, we're going to be talking about what is farm and, far and ranch income. And then what is exempt from federal taxes for tribal members, as well as other farmers and ranchers. We're also going to look at who is a farmer for IRS purposes. And that is very unique. The IRS code has a variety of sections talking about who's a farmer, what's a farm. And depending upon which pieces of the legislation we're talking about, there's a different definition of whether or not a certain level of farm income is needed or whether or not we have to be living on the farm, operating a farm, et cetera. Then we'll, lastly, we'll look at character of income. So a little bit more on our landing page, those topics. There is some information on tri tribal farm and ranch income being exempt. There's also a very unique calculator that Adam and I worked on. Adam was the primary lead on this. Farm tax calculator. It is a very unique tool set up in an Excel spreadsheet where you can fill out, work with your numbers to get an idea of an estimation of what your tax may be 
so that we can do a good job of tax planning during the course of the year. So the webinars, tax topics, other resources are all listed on ruletax.org. Again, visit the website. It's quite amazing what you will find there. So when is tribal income exempt from taxation? Again, you've got certain circumstances, certain conditions. When these are met, income from farming or ranching may be exempt from federal income and self-employment taxes for the farming on tro uh, tribal trust property. One of the issues though, is that not all members, tribal members meet those conditions and also not all the situations that do arise can we address. Uh, there's a lot of things that also have not been brought up for discussion. So there's more questions out there that, that haven't yet to be answered concerning when exactly is it taxable? When is it not taxable? And some of the rules and regulations uh, we've been approaching IRS over the years, trying to get them to give us clear guidance. Well, that hasn't occurred. So we're gonna do our best here to uh, answer or provide information and also help you understand what things you need to know, what things to ask. And again, when you look at the IRS code, there's no specific language there that applies to Native American farmers and ranchers. So it's a lot of it. We have to feel the waters, test them, see what happens, et cetera. So when is tribal income exempt? Well, we go back to a revenue ruling that occurred in 2006. This kind of explains what's going on. So it's revenue ruling 2006-20. Then take this to your tax preparer. They can help you explain what's going on. But basically what it says, it is an emphasis to taxpayers, promoters, and return preparers that there is no right to exemption from federal tax for Native Americans under any unspecified Native American treaty. In other words, subject to tax unless it's otherwise specified. So any return position based on any unspecified treaty, according to IRS, is has no merit and is frivolous. And what does that mean? That means IRS, if you put it on there, they may question it. The issue then become, drops back to you and your tax preparer. Can you prove your position? Can you then with the authority used, convince IRS that you have taken the right position. So basically what you're we're saying is you have the right and uh, authority to make the decision, base your decision on good facts, and then if called into question by IRS, you have the ability and desire to pr prove why and how you did that. So in general, Native Americans are subject to federal income tax, just like every other American. Again, that's the IRS ruling that came out in 2006. So there's two basic categories of income that are not subject to federal income tax. These are where a treaty or act of Congress has specifically provided that income being not subject to tax. There are some rules that are to apply, so it has to be derived directly from restricted allotted land. And there's some certain circumstances, and we'll get into those. Those circumstances must be met. And we'll talk about those in just a moment. So there, here's another couple of revenue rulings that came about one in 59, one in 63. And these revenue rulings, they, you see how old they are. That's what we're still dealing with because there's nothing been brought up to date. Even though we've asked, there's nothing been brought up to current levels. 2006 was the most current. So basically what these two revenue rulings pointed out, that the IRS says that income derived directly by a non-competent Indian there's some, what that means is basically there's restrictions on that individual. 
So the restriction there it has to be on allotted land, restricted land, so the Indian cannot own that. So it's avoided of being fee uh, land on trust property. So the General Allotment Act or directly derived from land held under acts or treaties, there's some exceptions. Under that General Allotment Act, it's not subject to federal income tax. So if we can fall under those two rulings, 59 and 63, there's that income that's not subject to income tax for tribal members. In those two sense, uh, situations, the IRS does recognize the exempt status of that income received by an enrolled member of a tribe where each of the following tests are met. Now, these are the circumstances. Five tests, and they, these five tests must all be met. So the land in question, so that's the first test, had land in question held in trust by the U.S. government. And such land is restricted and allotted and is held for individual, non-competent Indian, and not for the tribe. So it's held for the individual tribal members. The income being derived directly from that land. In the statute, treaty, or other authority involved invents the congressional intent that the allotment is used for the means of protecting the Indian until such time as he becomes competent. In other words, able to own land. The authority in question contains language indicating clear congressional intent that the land until conveyed in a fee simple to an allottee is not to be subject to taxation. And again, last thing here in bold, if one or, five, one or more of those five tests not met and then the income is not exempt, it is going to be subject to federal income taxation. So those are the rules and the circumstances that do, have, that do apply and you've got to look at. So when is tribal income exempt? So here we go back to a 1956 court case, Squire versus Kupperman. And what we ended up having to do, we, we went back to the Dawes Act of 1887 to get a better handle on what was in place. So the Dawes Act provided for tribal lands to be allotted to individual Indians in trust for a period of years after which the lands were to be conveyed to the allottee in fee that's free of charge or encumbrance whatsoever. And it has to be satisfied by those five prior tests. So again, we're going back to old law, 56. And then we have to look at the Dawes Act. So again, those three revenue rulings that were published by the IRS, they clarify the types of income which were determined to be derived from the land. And here they are. Here's the three groups. Rents as, and royalties, as well as income from the sale of crops or minerals that were on the land. Gains from the sale of livestock raised and grazed on allotted trust land. And again, you can see those two revenue rulings that point that out. Also, the third one, payments by USDA, for conservation of soil and water resources, that being also the maintenance of reasonable and stable supplies of ag commodities and the protection of farm income. That came out in 1969. So those are the three revenue rulings. And again, they've all been published by IRS. They all attempt to clarify types of income where that is exempt if it's derived from the land. So income that is subject to taxes. So those were the ones that was not. If we end up with some of these other things, it's going to be subject to income tax. The first one, renting from an entity that is exempt. So the tribe or the land that we're operating, if you rent it to somebody else, instead of operating yourself, the rent, the income that is derived from the land is not exempt. So the person that's renting it the income that they derive, they have to pay income tax on it. What about non-farm income? Income derived from the land only includes income to the first sellable point. So what are we talking about here? Let's go back to our meat, beef to meat. 
for uh, livestock to meet as we're looking at here. So meat to market. Once we take the animal and we harvest the animal and we're now selling meat, that is the second sellable point. The first sellable point would be the animal on the hoof, we're able to walk. Once we do something else to that animal, we have changed it from farm income to non-farm income. When it went from non-farm income, it is now going to be taxable income. So non-farm income being taxable. Partial use of trust land. Very unique situation, circumstances, where you got part of a production or business operation that's on land meeting the criteria, it would work, but there may be other pieces of that that do not qualify. So you've got to look at all the parts and pieces of the business, seeing what's going on, and you may have to separate, and depending upon, again, what the rules are and where you stand, part of that income may not be taxable, and part of it will be. The problem is, and you'll notice that second bullet point on that, this is where we have little or no guidance on how to treat it. Again, we've asked IRS for clarification. So far, we have not received that. So really, to no, no surprise, there are some of the issues. At this point, I'm going to cease my presentation. We'll get ready for Rob to take over. Any questions? Um, we've got one in the chat. I think that it actually is about the third section, but I'm not positive. So I'll just ask it and y'all tell us if you want to answer it now or later. It says when it comes to, Emily's asking, and when it comes to the amount of income, amount of income, is that still an or equivalent? I.e., if you are growing to provide for programs in your community, but not actually selling the crops. If you're providing, from the way I understand it, from the question you've asked, if you're providing it for programs within the tribe, that income will be not subject to tax. Does that, does the entity that is growing so when you say well, guess, entity, is it going to be an individual? So we may need right, some more exactly. information That's on this. my question. Yeah. So we may have to have some more, more information. If it's an individual, yeah. you, you've got one thing. Now, if it's a, a tribal group, I think we were looking at it being the same thing. Depending upon what, and please give us some more information here as to exactly what, when you say entity, what we're talking about. Then, yeah, and I, I think, JC, there's going to need to be a little bit more information and, and one, whether or not, obviously, there's there's a treaty that exempts uh, the income. Are we talking about also an entity that's a 501c3 LLC, sole proprietorship, et cetera, and whether or not this is actually being sold, sold to? Um, I mean, I'm assuming so just based off the question, but it doesn't say that they're really selling something for a program or am I just raising it and donating it? Sorry, Correct, I is, it, is it is it Oops. personal or is it, uh, is it something, I, I, are they somehow getting expenses reimbursed from the tribal entity? Mm -hmm. Emily, go ahead. More information. Let, let, let's hear Emily's refined question. Yeah, sorry. It didn't want to let me get off of mute. <laughs> I was having problems getting off. Um, I just, yeah, what I what the question is that I've come across before is that there have been people who want to get their USDA farm number so that they can, um, you know, benefit from some of the USDA programs. And there's like, I think it's like $1,000 a year of income or something that you have to make for that. Um, but when they had talked to USDA, they said, or equivalent, they said, if you're growing um, or producing more than fits with your family, um, if you're donating that to your community, if you're giving it to elders, if you're having it as part of a community program, then that counts as well. 
And one person that worked fine with, and then another person who had the same thing got told, oh, but you also have to qualify as a farmer for IRS. And so you need to file a tax return on it. And they didn't know how to do that for donating to the elders in their community. And so um, that was kind of my question because that's come up to me at a field day before. Yeah, so that there's actually two or three different things going on. And Rob and JC, please, please jump in here if I'm understanding correctly. One, you're really talking about being able to go to the USDA FSA, be able to register your farm to receive a farm number, and then be eligible for some potential programs. All that the USDA requires is that you are a farmer, and they've got a couple of different definitions for farming, um, and that is typically that you raise $1,000 worth of um, product within a year's period of time. Um, there are some definitions out there, including with the IRS, um, that also has a reference of for-profit. Okay, and it, whether or not you receive that farm number and you're registered with the USDA and you're going in and saying, here's how many acres I planted in the fall, you know, in the spring and here's what was harvested in the fall, uh, there are a different set of facts and circumstances that may be de that may have to be determined with regards to filing for the farm. But if you don't have any income being derived and I am not expensing anything and I am not um, for profit, I am not a nonprofit 501C, pick your pick your letter um, and number, then you may or may not need to file taxes. And so it's going to truly be based off of facts and circumstances. Um, we have to remember that USDA has uh, some of those folks may be more knowledgeable than others on the tax side of things. And I would take what they say as more or less a recommendation to go seek out a tax professional to see based on that individual's um, circumstances whether or not you do have to file uh, from a farming standpoint. Rob, JC. Go ahead, JC. Well, basically what I'm seeing is kind of the same thing. The issue really comes back to the uh, a specific program within USDA. There's certain rules apply differently across different programs as well. So it gets kind of, um, there's not a yes, no definite answer to your question. Uh, it, it all kind of depends upon which program and again, comes back to that uh, statement, well, you may have to prove that you're qualifying as a farmer. That may, on some programs, that requires a Schedule F. On others, it just means that you're operating the farm and the FSA can sign off on it. So we don't have a good answer. It basically comes back to uh, the facts and circumstances for each, each one of those specific questions and what they're wanting to do. Okay, thank you. I appreciate it because I do natural resources field days, but I get these kind of questions sometimes when I'm out there, which is why I really wanted to be on this webinar so I can answer them a little bit better for people. And I, I, I will tell you that, you know, I think each one of us have found that um, even some tax professionals get kind of confused with regards to some of this, unless they are a tax professional that also specializes in agricultural and or timber taxation. And so, but feel free to reach out to any one of uh, us three, or if you go to the ruraltax.org website, we do have a link where um, I, I would strongly encourage you and, and others that are on the call to, to become familiar with that website. And you can click on a link and send an email with a question and we have an individual that goes through and filters those and tries to find uh, the right individual that might be closest to you uh, from our committee to be able to respond. I noticed another question. Is there a tax benefit to meet the $1,000 in trade? Uh, <laughs> no tax benefit. 
it becomes a program, USDA program benefit if you can meet some of those rules. But if, from a tax point of view, no, there's not. And, and, and as it relates to the USDA FSA side of things and the programs and the same thing would go for NRCS and, and many of those other types of programs, even with that, it's, it's going to be a facts and circumstances. The, the biggest thing is you need to be able to register as a farm. You need to be able to meet those minimum definitions. And that may, may, all right, facts and circumstances will always prevail, but it may make you eligible for um, low interest loans, it may make you eligible for some other uh, federal uh, programs, some cost share dollars, uh, but it's all facts and circumstances and it all starts out with that farm number through USDA Farm Service Agency and, uh, and you'll have to be registered for that in many cases even for some NRCS funding. Yeah, if, this is Bruce Savage, and and uh, I want to thank Rob for being here again. I've been uh, throwing tax questions at him for about what twenty some years now, Rob. Yeah, about yeah. <laughs> and uh, and to just to clarify my 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 question there is, when you file your you know, and I think this is what a lot of our uh, tribal producers. Are, are struggling with is, you know, there is a tax benefit when you, when you produce a certain amount of food and, you know, and when I talk about the tax benefits is, is the expenses to be able to write off on some of your uh, costs to generate the food. And so that was my question. You know, a lot of folks do a lot of trade and I know that that's part of the what the programs recognize that you can have uh, up to a thousand dollars to qualify for different programs. But to generate that thousand dollars worth of food in a lot of our tribal community, it might cost you two thousand dollars to generate it. One of my uh, sayings is farming is very much like race cars. Uh, you start with a to, to make a small fortune, you have to start with a large fortune. fortune. <laughs> fortune. You're, you're, you are correct, Bruce. And, and one of the issues, though, with that, too, is we do have to be careful. IRS has their own definitions for different parts of the tax code. OK, so that's number one. Number two, um, they could come back. You, you know, it, it, I know farmers that do some things that they should not be doing and have <laughs> never once been audited. Then I know individuals that uh, push the gray area just a little bit and they're audited like clockwork. Once every seven to 10 years, they're audited. Um, and then others that are audited more frequently and never do anything wrong. That being said, there is a potential that the IRS could go ahead and say, listen, you're always losing money, X, Y, and Z. You may not, and Rob is going to be talking about this, you may <laughs> be considered a far you may not be considered a farmer, but a hobby, which means which and Rob will explain what some of that stuff is in, in his part of the presentation. Okay. But a lot of us, like you stated, we do a lot of trading and bartering with things, okay? And um, the way I'm going to put this is if you are a thief and I steal stuff, technically what I steal under IRS guidelines, I am supposed to report as income. So if I break into somebody's house and I steal a $2,000 TV, I have to actually report $2,000 of value as income and pay any tax liability associated with that, okay? Now, the reason why I bring that up is it's kind of similar from a trading or bartering standpoint. And typically when we're trading or bartering, I'm, I'm, uh, it's an equal out type thing, right? And so if, if I've got a whole bunch of hay ground and I need a bales, but I don't I don't have hay equipment. I might work with my neighbor who does have that hay equipment. And I may say, listen, 
I average eight bales to the acre or whatever it happens to be. You come and you make those large round bales for me, you know, throughout the season, all four cuttings or whatever it happens to be, and you get to keep two bales on average per per acre, per whatever, you know, if I'm out west, it ain't going to be eight bales an acre, you know, and it's not going to be anywhere close to that. But essentially, what I'm going to show is uh, that I had an expense, all right, of X amount of dollars uh, for, in essence, the value of uh, that in that custom hire, in essence, that trade of him or my neighbor, um, paying for me and then I'm going to have offsetting income on my return of the bales that were traded for that service okay we can get more technical because there's actually a 1099 bartering if you were to actually have a formal contract which is known as a bartering contract and so um and so it, it it's you have you do treat that but that is one way to be able to help with some of this process of what you're getting at bruce all right well thanks adam Th and bruce thanks for the thanks for the question and the comment too appreciate that i'm going to go ahead and slide into the to the next section here which is which is mine and i think we're coming through okay good um, good. Nope, just saying it, it. It's up, and we see we see the right slide, not the presenter view. So it's you're where you're supposed to be. Yep, that's what that's what we're looking for. So the next section here is who is a farmer for IRS purposes, and let let me coattail just a one quick comment that uh, actually Bruce Bruce helped me re reminded me of uh, of another uh, topic that we probably ought to talk about. We're 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 really talking 99.9% .9 of what we're talking about here today is federal but to, just to bring up the uh, issues of state as well you know your states oftentimes your state departments of revenue are going to be uh have different rules from what the federal is just as an example uh because in in previous conversations I've had with uh with all of the Fond du Lac tribes in Minnesota, I mean, we we really you know none, none of the, there's no treaty existing uh, in, with any of the tribes in Minnesota that's really exempting uh, income from federal from federal income tax. However, the state of Minnesota does exempt. All right, if you're an enrolled tribal member and the money was derived off off uh, tribal lands and uh then it it just it becomes exempt from uh from state income so bear in mind that uh, there's you know each state could have their separate rules carved out on that i guess the only ones specifically that i'm familiar with is minnesota and montana those are the two that i've that i've worked with in the past but uh, and there's exemptions uh for both of those but uh, sliding into what I'm going to talk about here next is, uh, you know, we're going to talk about who is a farmer for IRS purposes. Now, what, uh, folks, what we need to talk about here is, is there's, for, for different provisions, there's different rules. Now, I, I, I thought about grabbing my copy of the code and showing you how complicated everything is. It, it, we, we, we know without saying the IRS code and regulations and everything, they are very complicated. And, and one of the things uh, that, that I find frustrating is that there's a lot of farming provisions that have different rules. We don't have just one uniform set of rules on this. And, that, and that's part of what we're gonna talk about. And it's not gonna be, we're, gonna, we're not gonna be able to hit everything in our time, in our allotted time. But, uh, but that's one thing I wanna say from the very onset. Now, on the tax return, all right, farm income, you know, in a, in a non-incorporated entity, uh, the, you know, you're filing a 1040, the farm income goes on a Schedule F. And the reason we say that is we want to be able to separate out the farm from the non-farm income. So if I'm, if I'm farming, uh, I'm going to report all my income and expense 
on schedule F. And uh, the net ends up uh, flowing to the flowing through to the 1040 and then the taxes get calculated. All right, if I have a non-farm business, all right, let's say I've got a hardware store that's not incorporated. All right, I'm not going to file that on Schedule F because it's not a farm. All right, Schedule C is where non-farm businesses get uh, get reported. So when in, in our discussion, Schedule F is where farm income gets reported. Schedule C is where non-farm income gets reported. Now, uh, to, to meet that IRS definition of a farmer, you have to have a certain percentage of your farm income be from the farm. Uh, that's and that, but that that's only for for certain provisions that we have in there. You can not be classified as a farmer for IRS purposes and still still be a farmer. I mean, you could you could be producing uh, crops and uh, and and you could have farm income, but you may not meet that definition of the IRS and you may not meet all the provisions that we're going to talk about here today. So so we're not trying to to confuse anybody, but uh, but but it, it's confusing to start with. Let's talk a little bit about some farm versus non-farm examples, and and let me just read through these a little bit because uh, yeah, the, these these were these were some examples that we came up with with some previous uh, programs. Okay, we got Bob in this situation raises wheat and sells his wheat to the local elevator. All right, Rosa uh, has a uh, has goats. She sells the milk uh, to a local organic co-op. Uh, Amal. Uh, grows flowers, sells it weekly at a local local farmers market. Uh, Ricardo is growing lettuce and cabbage, sells to a processing company. Louisa Louisa has uh, has a cattle ranch and she sells uh, calves to a feedlot investor. All right, uh, let me digress here just for a moment. Uh, the 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 code in most cases is going to talk about farms. Please understand, farm and ranch under these definitions are completely and totally interchangeable. So if you're running a ranch, farm is still applicable. And if it says farm here, it, it means farm or ranch. Now, in all of these cases that we, that we went through here, the producer is growing a product and selling that product. And they haven't further processed or modified it. All right, so that's going to be a Schedule F income. All right, no, none of these examples that we have here, we didn't do any 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 additional processing to the to the commodity. We you know we're selling the we're selling the wheat, we're selling the milk, we're selling the flowers, which you know horticultural operations are also considered farming. Uh, lettuce, cabbage, uh, and also uh, calves. You know that's that's production of that. So that's all going to be farm income. Now let's throw a little different twist in the thing. All right, where can you have a farming operation and still have some non-farm income? All right, here, here here's a couple of examples. You might have, for instance, a, a vineyard or a winery. All right, and you may or may not have that, but this is this is an example that we're going to talk about here a little bit. Now, with a with a vineyard and a winery, you've got the production of the grapes, right? You got to grow the grapes in order to in order to make to ultimately make the product. Well, the sale of the grapes, we're not doing anything to the grapes. If we if we sell the grapes, uh, that's going to be farm income. Now, once we turn that into grape juice or wine or make it into jelly we're processing that and that then turns that into a schedule c operation all right it no longer is a farming operation it turns it into a schedule c non-farm operation now here's another example i and i guess and I, I see this in my area quite a bit. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of out on the prairie in southwest Minnesota, and we have a lot of apple orchards and uh, pumpkin, pumpkin patches that we'll, uh, that we'll see uh, in, in the fall. Uh, and uh, now if, if, if uh, you know, if I go to the apple orchard and I buy a bushel of apples, 
and uh, bring that home. Well, the farm sold the apples. That's going to be Schedule F. All right. Now, if the farm makes that into apple bread, apple butter, jellies, jams, if they're if they're further processing that stuff, then it becomes uh, Schedule C because the because the raw product's been been uh, processed and made into something else. Now. The one exception to that is going to be honey. Uh, honey in this example is the exception. You you can uh, you can you can put honey into a container with the comb, or even if you separate it, it's still considered farm income, and that's just something in the Treasury regulations that that carves out. It's an exception to the rule. All right, now let's let's uh, look at a couple other things here. Uh, the uh, the definition of a farmer, and this is just the generic definition, includes stock, dairy, poultry, fruit, fur-bearing animal, truck farms, plantations, ranch, nurseries, ranges, greenhouses, uh, similar structures, you know, for, for producing commodities, orchards, and woodlands. All right, that's a very broad, broad statement, and that's pretty much what comes out of comes out of the farmer's tax guide. So that's just a generic definition of a farmer. And in a lot of cases, as long as you've got that that thousand dollars and you're meeting these criteria, a lot of times that's that's what that's what uh, USDA is going to be looking for. But remember, some programs are going to require you to have a schedule F uh, because that's one of the first things they're going to be asking for uh, when you go in to look at those programs. Now. Uh, some of the things that that will change uh, that that we look at, uh, we look we look to uh, the guidance here, and and folks, the 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 IRS documentation here is uh, is in the very small print, but uh, you know we we define gross income from farming, uh, soil and water conservation expenses. All right, that's something that farmers can take, but but you have to be actively farming in order to take a soil and water conservation expense. If you happen to be cash renting, I re and I've run into this question a lot just this last year, is uh, you know, if you've got a cash rent, uh, you've, got, you've got somebody that's uh, cash renting the land out and they put terraces or they did some ditch work or something on the in the land, um, it gets added to the basis because they're not actively farming. So, uh, so you know, there's provisions for soil and water conservation expenses for estimated taxes. I got a slide coming up on this, but we've got very favorable rules for farmers that meet that that meet that guideline. Uh, there's there's uh, favorable rules for uh, excise tax on gasoline, and uh, you know, this list is not all inclusive, but it but it does cover a lot of uh, co cover a lot of the major things that we that we look at. Now, uh, here's that definition from Pub 225. You know, if you're cultivating, operator, or managing a farm for profit, you know, that's generally what we look at for uh, that definition of a farmer. Adam mentioned earlier the hobby loss rules. This is something that we we do need to look at on occasion. Now, now, in order to have a trader business, you do have to have a profit motive, and uh, one of the more common things that I run into on a on a on an annual basis is uh, i'll have practitioners from our tax schools call up and they'll ask about uh, you know a, a particular uh, situation that they're working on with a client uh, uh, a, a a common thing that we see is somebody may have uh, you know somebody may be living in town they've got a they got a job in town and what they do is they buy you know they buy 10 acres in the country and it happens to have a barn there. And what they do is they they buy some cows or buy some sheep or something like that. They're going to farm on a small scale. And what they do is they start treating everything as a farm expense because they have a farm expense. And then they go to the attack, they go to the tax accountant, and this farm lost like you know an extraordinary amount of money. And uh, and and that's that that that's unfortunately. Uh, not all those expenses are attributable to the production of whatever that commodity is that they have. So, so that starts to fall into the hobby loss rules where you might, you might lose that deductibility of those expenses. 
that we find on there. And and if and if this is a if this if you've got follow-up questions on that, shoot me an email. There's a list of nine factors I could email you real quick to uh, to look at those. I think one of the most uh, uh, beneficial benefits that farmers get is this one right here for estimated tax purposes. Now, here's the basic rule. It, we we add up all the farm income, sales of livestock, sale of breeding livestock, and uh, you know we take we take the gross amount of income that uh, that that producer had in that given year. Then we take that and we divide it by the total income, which we'd add you know maybe W two income or off farm income, and we we look at what percentage the farm income makes up of the total income for the operation. If it's two thirds or more, if the farm income is two thirds or more of that, of that income, they're exempt from having to make estimated tax payments. All right, they don't have to make quarterly estimated tax payments, but the, 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 what, what the farmer then has to do is the farmer has to file the tax return by March 1 instead of April 15th. All right. Now, one way to get around that is is the the farmer can do a January fifteenth estimated tax payment, and that extends the return due deadline until April fifteenth if they do that. But this only works for folks where two thirds of the income is coming from a farming operation. All right, and and this is actually huge because everybody else, all of the businesses in the you know everywhere, uh, have to pay. Uh, estimated te- quarterly estimated tax payments based on either estimated current year income or uh, previous year's income. Okay, let's look at these couple of examples here. We got Jose here, uh, raises sheep, and it's, excuse me, this is Josie. Uh, this is Josie's uh, primary source of income and uh, you know the the sale of those market lambs and the wool is over two thirds of the total income coming in to the household. All right. So in this case, this individual does qualify as a farmer. They they're not required to make estimated tax payments over the course of the year. All right, uh, Susie. In this case, second example grows herbs for a sale at a local farmer's market. Now she also happens to be a computer engineer for a software company. So her herb sales are a small part of her total income. All right, so since the, since the herb sales are less than two thirds of her total income, she's not gonna qualify for uh, as, as a farmer in IRS's eyes. She's still going to report the herb sales on her schedule F, it's still farm income. She just doesn't, she's just not going to be exempt from doing the uh, estimated tax payments. All right. The uh, other thing, installment sales, uh, cash basis farmers, essentially you, you report the income when you actually receive the income. Uh, another, another way we put it is constructive receipt of income. If, uh, you know, if I sell, uh, you know, if I sell, uh, some corn, you know, which, which is, would be a common thing that we would, that we, you know, we grow a lot of corn and soybeans where I'm, where I'm at. Uh, if I take corn to the elevator and I, uh, get paid for it, I, you know, the day that I get paid for it, that's when I book it in my in my farm records and that's going to be when I when I actually pay that uh, pay you know when I'm going to report that as income and have to pay the tax on it uh, oftentimes farmers may manipulate when those payments actually occur if I'm in the middle of December if I'm at the end of December and I have to sell some corn you know I might want to postpone that sale until January of the next year because I want the income next year rather than the income this year and that that's one of those areas where it's really uh, advantageous to have a good set of books and working with a tax accountant in order to know what uh, what you want to do at the end of the year. Uh, fertilizer, uh, if you if you're applying fertilizer to your uh, to your crops, the uh, you know you can either elect to uh, amortize that fertilizer over a period of time, or you can just elect to expense it the year that you pay the bill. Uh, that's that's one thing that that farmers can do as well. And uh, farm use of vehicle. All right, if you've got a farming operation 
and you've got a uh, say you have a pickup uh the farmers can take a 75 75 percent business use of that pickup truck and they can they can count that 75 percent as business use on the tax return without having to have any kind of a business logbook or anything like that for mileage whereas most other businesses need to have a logbook of some sort to to prove the business use of that vehicle now this is a safe harbor that that is that that works for farmers and it's uh it, it's just a, it's a very powerful tool all right the final thing i wanted to talk about here is income averaging and and we've we've had a lot of discussion over that over the last couple of years because I, even even by irs's uh, admission they they say that this is an underused uh, technique on on uh, on uh, tax returns. Now, income averaging really doesn't average the income. What it does is it blends the rates that you're able to take, and uh, uh, it's something that you it's something that you can file on the tax return at the time that you file it. A uh, thing worth noting is that forestry doesn't qualify for income averaging, but but all other income essentially is. Now I've got a graph here that I want to look at here, and this this is uh, this is a graph that I've used for years on uh, kind of explaining how this works. Now, folks, you, you I think everybody on here understands there's different tax brackets when you when you uh, when you file a return. For instance, there's a you know there's a 10% bracket, a 12% bracket, and then and it and it jumps up from there. The black line that goes across the horizontal part of the part of the uh, uh, screen here is the top of the 12% bracket. Anything below that line would be taxed at 12% or lower and income above that level is going to be taxed at a higher level. Now, if we look at income over, you know, and this, this was uh, uh, the, from 18, 19 and 20, Okay, what we do is we look at the income from the prior three years. Imagine this is a 2021 example that we that we find here. Over the last prior three years, this individual had income below the 12% bracket, and they had high income in 2021. So what they can do is they can take some of that excess income in 2021, and they can put it back into the unused brackets in the prior three years and you and fill up those 12% brackets rather than paying the 22% higher rate if they would leave it alone and not do that in in uh, 2021 all right and and to do to do 2022 we just add a year to all of the all of the lines if we, if we were doing 2022 we'd be carrying back to 21 uh 21 20 and 20 and 19 would be the three things there. It does not affect self-employment tax uh, and uh, it doesn't really affect taxable income. It just blends the rates is all it does. All right, that wraps up my section for that. Olivia, do we have any questions out there that we want to address? We do, and they're really good ones. Um, so we have two similar questions that uh, I was going to bring up if nobody else did. So to Justine and Emily, I'm so glad you did essentially talking about the benefits of potentially having two different entities, right? So Justine asks, would there be any benefit to essentially selling your raw product to another business entity, right? Forming a separate LLC, which would then go through the process part and sell the processed goods. Justine, I'm gonna spoil it for everybody. She is also a rancher and produces meat. And so this is a perfect question for this group. Um, and Emily asks, do you have to report stuff that you grow on the farm and process, like a transfer of product from F to C? So this is a related question, right? And one is a bookkeeping question, and then there's a tax ramification. So I'll let you guys um, handle that, and then I have a little thing to add at the end of your okay. I'll I'll take a stab I'll take a stab at these first, and then uh, let Adam and uh, and JC weigh in here. The, the 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 raw product to a different entity there's absolutely nothing wrong with that the thing is is that each entity may have you know you're going to need to independently determine whether each entity is a farm or not all right this is a heavy livestock group so let's talk livestock 
if you're selling calves or selling fat cattle to the to the plant that's schedule f all right if you're taking that if you're taking a, a finished calf to the meat locker and you're paying for the processing and everything and you're selling the processed meat that's not schedule f that's going to be schedule c now if you're if the processing side of things is a different entity that different entity if that if that in is income generated from that different entity that different entity you do a determination on whether that entity is a farm or not you may have one entity that does qualify for a farm and you have another entity that doesn't qualify for a farm so it it, it is a pseudo bookkeeping piece on this now uh, if you're doing this all on Emily's question, if you're doing this stuff all on one return, uh, you you can do internal transfers, but it's a lot cleaner, folks. If you have a separate entity, uh, whereas uh, you know you're selling you're selling you know say say the uh, grape grower that's making uh, jellies, for instance. Okay, they're going to show grape sales on Schedule F, and then they're going to sell the jellies under Schedule C. Your tax professional is probably going to steer you towards doing a separate entity, and you're going to have you're going to have sales going between those two entities in order to make that work. Or at least, if if it were my practice, that's the way I would recommend that it be done. And there's Rob, a couple of other reasons you? for that too, Rob, to be yeah. able to, to have those two entities. Um, you know, one is sometimes we have a tendency not to pay attention to our record keeping and accounting, and that creates some issues. And so when we've got something like just been described where I've got some of my own beef that I am raising, and then I am taking it to, to the locker, and then I'm selling those retail cuts, a lot of my expenses, et cetera, from an accounting perspective is all just jumbled into one big pot, which makes it very difficult for me sometimes, unless you are really following enterprise accounting rules, to pull out the information necessary for me to be able to make better management decisions. So that so that's number one. Number two, you know, in theory, depending on the situation, there could be some tax ramifications, but there's going to be facts and circumstances that surround that. Um, at three, uh, from a USDA FSA side, it's also going to create some issues. So usually, and I think Rob and JC would both agree, our typical recommendations are going to be have separate entities, separate checkbooks, and separate accounting records for each of those two entities. And the other big reason is a liability issue, okay? Uh, liability and insurance to be able to separate our entities if God forbid something happens um, it's never ever a guarantee that you are protecting the other entity and your other assets but it does offer an additional challenge when somebody does sue you to be able to access those other those other assets and those other entities you know if they can prove gross negligence or specific illegal activity um, all bets are off the table. It doesn't matter how many entities you have, what entity you have, uh, they can go after everything and anything. But there's multiple reasons to have that. And we would strongly encourage you have multiple entities, sell one to the other, okay? Keep it separate, have a separate set of accounting records for that and a separate checkbook, okay? Meaning a separate bank account. Can I hop in here real quick? Um, Absolutely, Olivia. I she, I saw, I saw she, she was trying to get in. Well, no, no, no. That was great, Adam. Adam said ninety percent of what I wanted to just clarify the difference between your, you know, tax return, your business entity, and your accounting books, just to make sure that language is clear, clear for everybody. And um, there, it, it, I worked with a lot of producers that do this all different ways and I don't want anybody to freak out <laughs> who is here uh, raising animals and selling meat my recommendation is sort of take it step by step the most important thing that I think Adam said for y'all to consider is liability right and that these two types of activities have very different costs associated with them and so you do yourself a service by separating the accounting books 
because they are different activities that you can analyze much more appropriately if they are separated out on the books side. Then I recommend speaking with an attorney and an insurance agent for understanding whether you truly need two different entities. And if you have two separate books, you can do the intercompany sale between the two. Your tax account will be very happy. C and F stay very clean. Um, and I'm going to drop another resource in the chat right here. You know, this whole program was springboarded from a series that we did with the Southwest Grass-Fed Livestock Alliance. And we went real deep into tax issues especially concerning meat inventory. It's a two-part series. I'm gonna drop the link in here. Um, you can get access to all of our courses, which have some repetition with these, but specifically that the, the inventory and tax basics one is really in depth. Um, and membership is free for the first year. So I'm just gonna throw that in there for everybody. If they are so excited by this conversation that they wanna spend four more hours on it. Which... I, I will say a uh, real world example. Um, I worked with a family very, very closely. They had dairy animals. They, uh, they were doing a few different things with the milk, uh, including making uh, of organic cheese. And um, it took them 10 years to break into the larger markets, fine end markets, selling across multiple states as far away as the, uh, New England states from where they were in the upper Midwest. And then a whole bunch of people in multiple states started getting sick. And so they had about $90,000 of cheese yet in the aging room, all of which had to get tossed. Um, and they had to recall all any all and any cheese that was still out there in inventory to be able to and had to pay for all of that recall. Um, and luckily, because they did have a separation, um, they had three different business entities, in fact. And so they were able to actually protect their assets um, in the other two entities and essentially uh, the insurance that they held uh, which was not cheap insurance, but they paid it, and luckily they did because they had to use it to be able to cover all the costs, including a lot of hospitalization costs of some individuals that had gotten really sick from it. So, perfect example of why it may never ever happen to you, and but if you pull the short straw, it can really, really hurt. I think Bruce has a question, Olivia. Yep, yep, go ahead, Bruce. Yeah, um, mute. But uh, with with the comment about corn, now I understand. I understand everything you guys are saying, and and I appreciate this. This is good information. But in 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 our farming practices, a lot of farmers will grow the corn, right? And that's farming. But then they harvest it, and they shell it, and they dry it. Are all those expenses classified as farming? Yes. Now, there's my my question to that is that's a two step processing beyond farming, and I and I understand that, and I'm not I'm not criticizing your answer. What I'm what I'm asking is. Like even for the honey folks, who lobbies the treasurer department then to make those laws applicable to what tribal producers are doing? You, you understand, Rob? You know what I'm talking about. There, there I, is that, that that is a policy issue, and you need to either become part of a larger lobbying organization uh, to change those tax laws or begin uh, vocally, you know, as a group, um, create a statement and as a group, everybody start making contact with your local delegation um, in DC um, to be able to get those things changed. However, the way that this is being looked at 
is what you just described, Bruce, is part of the normal management practices, i.e. dealing with the corn, okay? Because we're combining it as part of harvest, right? And then depending on how we're going to use that, whether it's for animal feed, et cetera, um, is all part of normal, what, what is determined as best management practices and or normal uh, practices within the farming industry. Whereas me taking an animal and slaughtering that animal and cutting it into wholesale and or retail cuts is not normal farming practices. And um, because you have to change the character of the product um, so dramatically for human consumption for the next step, the next market, um, is is where they really take a look at, at those breaks. Yeah, but uh, but unfortunately, our agriculture in Indian country isn't considered normal. So that's why I asked the, the question on how our producers would be able to get some of our practices recognized that, that for kind of, those tax benefits. Yep, yeah, and it, that will, and that will, unfortunately, it's gonna require um, policy change. That, I mean, that, that's, that's yep. what it comes down to. Yeah, I, I understand that, but that's why I was, I was asking, you know, if there's anyone on these events that, knows of organizations that actually look out for the tax benefits. Because one of the things in business is making the money doesn't always be as benefit as saving money. Because it takes money to be able to save money. It does. Bruce, well, and Bruce, I think, and Bruce, um, oh, sorry, Rob. Just well, real quick, I, if IAC has a, policy arm that's pretty active and so i would encourage you to get in touch with you know that that's just one organization that that is actively working maybe not always on tax issues but you know one broad policy issue so well ahead, the, Rob, other, sorry. the other thing bruce i was going to say is that i mean right now we're we're hearing that there's discussions on farm bill now whether they're going to get that done this year or not uh who knows but uh, that's a that's a whole nother discussion but that's one of those things that really lends itself well to you know the best place to try and get something like that done is in the farm bill so possibly, you know, IEC making some contacts and, you know, congressional contacts, uh, it, it, uh, that stuff always has to start with grassroots. And we, we do have to be careful because the way certain topics have to go to different committees. And so, you know, besides this dealing with House and Senate Ag committees, as soon as it starts dealing with tax, I believe that has to go to uh, depending on what side we're talking about, I can't remember it's ways and means, and also um, on the other, in the other side, there's a there's a, a another committee that would have to run through, comes out of committee, goes into then the general assembly, i.e., House and or Senate, and then goes back and forth as you know normal part of of policy lawmaking. So, um, but. There's a lot of discussions now, like Rob indicated, with the farm bill being um, starting to be brought up again. Um, and so now would be an opportune time to be able to raise these questions with your local delegation. Um, that as you're discussing these farm bill things, here are some of those other situations that you might be able to even deal with on off to the side. So Olivia, if there's nothing else, I will start sharing my screen and bring up the yeah, last, I think we're good. last portion. And since, um, okay, let's see here. For some reason, all right, there we go. Is everybody seeing that uh, the slide? 
I can't see anybody because I've yeah. got okay good deal all right so we're going to talk about character of income there's going to be a few slides in here that were already brought up through uh, rob's presentation so i'm going to kind of skip over some of those as we get into that we're going to discuss a little bit of characterization of income um, you know as many of us we like being outside we like working on the land we like working with our livestock and unfortunately, records always gets the short end of the stick. You know, it's our, one of our least favorite tasks to deal with. Unfortunately, it's one of the most necessary. And technically, we can be we can track our records via computer software manually in record books. And when I first started, just like Rob and JC and many of our counterparts, you know, long before there was any really main software that most farmers use. We use the old extension farm record keeping system or something along those lines. Individuals using three ring binders, spiral notebooks. I have tried moving all farms that I work with away from that just simply out of fear of being audited, even though that rarely occurs. But if we can move and get used to and understand some basic software that can track our information it becomes a lot more useful to us to be able to garner the necessary data and reports for us to make better management decisions that's number one number two to run the reports necessary to be able to provide to our tax professional when we have to file taxes or if we're doing our own taxes to be able to pull that information out uh, for us to file our own taxes um, as well so the biggest thing is we have to have a system, we have to be consistent about it, and we have to reconcile that system. And we have to reconcile it uh, based on our checkbooks, our credit cards, our any loans we may have. We have to reconcile it as part of also our production. Um, and so we really need to be able to follow through with this, be consistent, and this needs to be part of our normal weekly process for our farming activities, not just something we remember a few weeks before we have to file our taxes, okay? Because we do a much poorer job of capturing things, which may cost us more in tax liability because we don't have all the deductions that we should have had. Uh, we're not able to take advantage of some of the other credits that may be out there, etc. So it's a very important part of our process. And so we need to be able to have a system that is very specific to deal with actual farm cash income, um, our expenses, capital purchases, capital sales. And, and, and in many cases, we like to track even the personal income expenses as well. And we may need to do so uh, in some situations. And so, and if you can find software that allows you to enter a quantity as part of the transaction meaning if i'm selling you know some beef to a consumer to a restaurant to wherever i want to be able to put in the quantity that i am selling right there as part of that transaction if i'm buying uh, food i'm buying mineral blocks i want to be able to put down in that transaction when i make that purchase how many blocks did I purchase? How many pounds did I purchase, et cetera? Okay, so just a few things that we need to think about. So now, when we get to taxes, there's all sorts of different taxes. And typically, from a farming perspective, we're looking at two or three different things that, that we really need to be aware of. It may or may not affect us on a regular basis. One is ordinary income. The next is capital gain, and you can see there that gets split into two different types, short and long. Depreciation recapture. If you have a trader business, this is something we always have to be aware of because we have machinery equipment that we depreciate. Then we have the self-employment tax, and we have something known as net investment income. I left that in there. I'm not going to really talk too much about that, but that is something that we do need to be considered, and especially as we start aging out and we may begin to back off or retire from our farming activities and it's time for the next generation to come into play we may have assets that are being sold we may have land that might be even being handed down that 
uh, we may actually own that might be being sold uh, to the next generation and we may see net investment income become an issue from a tax perspective. So we talked about early on marginal tax rates and this is usually what we're referencing as an individual whether you own your own business or you're working for somebody else you're going to have to pay income taxes this is at the federal level each state is a little bit different on how they handle things from the state whether or not they have uh, their rates correspond to the feds or if it's different okay now i've only got two examples here single individual married filing jointly but there's a couple of other different ways i can file my taxes and you can kind of see here how things break down and the different margins on what you're going to pay so it's important to understand that if you're married filing jointly and i've got uh, taxable income based off of all my income sources of let's say a hundred thousand dollars you can see if I'm married filing jointly, that $100,000 falls into the 22% income tax bracket. But we have to understand that not all $100,000 is being taxed at that 22%. Okay? The first $22,000 is taxed at 10%. And then the difference between $89,450 and twenty two dollars is taxed at 12%. And so... 100,000 minus that 89,450 is about $10,550. That's the only portion of that that gets taxed at that 22%. Okay. And so this is our typical marginal tax rate schedule that we look at. Then we hear the term effective tax rate. Well, what does that mean? If I take my total federal income tax that I had to pay, and I divide that by the total income from all my sources, all right? So if I had to pay $30,517 in taxes, and I divide that by all my income, that 186.5, my effective tax rate is going to be 15.8%, even though I might have a marginal tax rate much higher than that, okay? And so... You know, in this case, your marginal tax rate, depending on how you're filing, is going to be potentially at the 24%. And so we need to understand these different little terms and how the tax system works from the very basics of it so that we can better understand what we need to do and understand these other taxes when we are actually farming, we're self-employed, and, and what, what happens. So let's start looking at ordinary farm income. So this is income that is derived from the sale of what we produce on the farm, whether that is livestock, whether that's milk production, whether I am raising uh, honey from bees, or I am selling uh, vegetables or herbs, or other crops for that matter. When I sell that and I receive income, that is considered ordinary income uh, from my farming activities, and it's going to be treated at the marginal tax rate. Then we have capital assets. All right, so what does this mean? Capital assets are, are those assets uh, based on IRS rules that get depreciated out However, there is one asset that does not get depreciated, and that's going to be land. You cannot depreciate land. Now, we have to understand there's a difference between tax depreciation and economic depreciation. And so when we're taking a look at and talking and discussing about certain things from a tax perspective, we are talking about tax depreciation. So anything that is purchased that has to be depreciated, such as machinery, breeding livestock. Now, when we talk about breeding livestock, we are talking about those animals that we own, that we are breeding to get offspring. Okay, and this also includes my milking cows, um, even, you know, milking sheep, etc. All right. If I am raising P 
purebred animals or I've got a closed herd and I am raising animals to be sold to others for them to use as breeding. Those offspring that I'm selling to be used to, by somebody else to breed are not capital assets. That's livestock held for sale. Okay. Now, that being said, when I make a purchase of a capital asset, I do not get to deduct that as a cash expense like I would fertilizer. I have to follow IRS rules on how I can depreciate that. There are some depreciation methods that do allow me to depreciate 100% of that value, okay, um, within a single year, but just because I can doesn't mean I should, all right? So anything that's purchased that has to be depreciated or whose purchase cost cannot be deducted until disposition, meaning when I sell it, all right, is going to be typically considered a capital asset. And what that means is in my accounting, I need to make sure that I treat those items, those assets differently than I treat them, than I treat something like fertilizer or seed or the purchase of feeder animals. Okay. So capital assets are subject to what is known as capital gains treatment, either long term and or short short term. Okay. And or depreciation recapture upon its disposition. So what does that mean? Well, when I go ahead and I sell my capital assets, I'm going to have to report that sale. And even if I trade in a piece of equipment, that gets reported as a sale, even though I did not directly receive cash for it you're technically receiving a credit towards the purchase of something else. But from an IRS perspective, we have to treat that as if it was a sale, okay? And so you have to pay depreci depreciation recapture and or a uh, capital gain dependent on the situation, all right? And so what that means is if I get to depreciate something, that depreciation gets treated just like a cash expense, all right? So if I am depreciating something out following IRS code, that gets removed and subtracted from my taxable income. It lowers my taxable income. I receive a tax benefit. So upon disposition of that asset, I'm going to, in essence, have to repay back. I'm going to have to pay back some of that tax benefit. Now, I don't have an example here, but I'm going to talk you through an example. And this is a real world example. I had a farm in one particular year that could not find a piece of new equipment they wanted to purchase. So they purchased a piece of used equipment for $20,000. They depreciated that piece of equipment out, used it for two seasons. Okay, it, and then after those two seasons, based on the method of depreciation they used, it had zero tax basis in it. They then, two seasons later, turned around and sold that piece of equipment for $28,000. So when they sold the piece of equipment for $28,000, the first $20,000, which was what got depreciated for tax purposes, they're going to have to pay depreciation recapture. From a tax perspective, it's treated very similar to short-term capital gains. Short-term capital gains are treated at whatever your marginal tax bracket is, okay, what we were looking at just a few slides ago, all right, and it is not subject to self-employment tax, and we'll talk about self-employment tax in a little bit. Okay, now that extra $8,000 since he sold it for $28,000, that $8,000 in essence is a profit. And since he held on to that piece of equipment for long enough, he's going to pay long term capital gain, all right, on that $8,000. And that long term capital gain um, gets treated at a, um, uh, at a pretty good rate. 
And so it's going to be either at 0%, 15%, or 20%, depending on where you are in your marginal tax brackets, or actually what your total uh, taxable income is will determine that. Now, just as a side note, one, if you sell a Babe Ruth card, that's considered a collectible, and so the capital gains, long-term cap gain rate on that's going to be about 28%. If you are a corporation, in particular a C corporation, there are no capital gains. Everything is, is, is the normal corporate tax rate, no matter what occurs, okay? So, common types of income. Wages and business income is gonna follow that marginal tax rate, okay? Then we have other types of income that's known as investment. Um, and uh, investment income, there may be some rental income, we may have some dividends and those things, and there's various tax rates, depending on the filing status that you have. Um, and, you know, some may be subject to SE tax, others may not be. Again, facts and circumstances are going to tell us that, all right? Wage income is typically taxed at the current bracket rate, and self-employment tax is going to be paid in the manner of FICA, Medicare, usually through withholdings that you'll see on your W-2. But if I'm self-employed, all right, we need to think about this. If I'm self-employed and I have profitable, if I've got profits and taxable income from my business, i.e. my farm, um, you are the employer and the employee you're going to have to pay that self-employment tax, okay? And so that SE tax or self-employment tax is really you're paying the employer share and the employee share, which is about 15.3%, okay? My in, in investment income, again, this is very dependent, facts and circumstances, this is kind of a rule of thumb, is going to be taxed at our current bracket rate, and is generally not subject to that self-employment tax. So let's talk about this a little bit more. My farm business and even non-farm business income. So Schedule F, Schedule C, all right, is typically going to be taxed at the current bracket rate, all right, and my self-employment tax, I'm going to have to pay on any income that is subject to it 15.3%. Now, out of that 15.3%, 12.4% is made up of my Social Security, and then my 2.9% is part of Medicare. Now, that Social Security part, there is a cap, all right? So for 2023, um, once I reach $160,200, I am no longer going to have to pay that 12.4% on any income above that number, okay? Whereas of that 2.9% is going to be on all of that ordinary income subject to self-employment tax. Then we get into farm rental income, and this becomes a little bit tricky. Facts and circumstances are going to come into play. And we may have farm rental income based off of renting out my land. In many cases, we may have land that might be owned and or even machinery, equipment, and even livestock that may not be owned by the actual operating entity. And so I might be renting that as an individual to the operating entity itself, okay? It may or may not be subject to self-employment tax. And so we just need to be aware of that. Facts and circumstances are going to tell us in those cases whether or not it will be subject to it. And so you really need to work with a tax professional in being able to determine that, okay? So back to depreciation. Qualifying capital assets, and there are uh, multiple publications by the IRS uh, that describe depreciation and also have, um, there's a pretty large book or publication that the IRS has, you can find it online, and it has a list of just about every known asset that you can think of, and it will tell you, um, depending on the depreciation method you have, how many years its taxable life is, that if you follow certain 
depreciation methods, how long it gets depreciated out, etc. And so you really need to use some good tax management strategies to really think about what depreciation method is going to be appropriate for you. Okay. Um, there are some other rules that are out there, including purchases of certain items and assets that may technically be a capital asset. However, because of its value, and if I have a written policy um, as part of my entity, my business entity, I might be able to treat that more like a cash expense instead of treating it like a capital asset purchase okay and so we have to be careful with regards to these because we may or may not have to deal with the recapture uh, depending on the situation and so we just need to be careful with regards to that and especially if we we're right on the border whether or not something that's being purchased or dealt with is a repair or am i actually extending the life or changing the function of of an asset with some of those repairs etc we, that starts to get really, really technical um, and, and is really more of a topic for, for a different program. Then we have some, some things known as special depreciation. And this include things like Section 179 and bonus depreciation. And Section 179 and bonus depreciation allows us to um, either take a portion of the value of the asset um, or the entire um, purchase price of the asset and depreciate it in a single year instead of slowly depreciating it over a series of years. But again, tax management and what we plan on doing in the future really needs to take precedence in determining whether or not we use those special depreciation methods. And so, Typically, when I go ahead and I then sell or trade a piece of machinery in, it's going to be taxed at an ordinary income marginal tax rate, but not subject to self-employment tax. And this is known as that depreciation recapture. This gets reported on Form 4797, Part 1. You know, this is for those sales of assets that I held for more than a year, which means it's going to be potentially treated as long term cap gains if I, in fact, made a profit on it. Part two is for those sales of assets held less than a year. Um, again, these are rules of thumb short term gain potential. Part three is gain from sale of depreciable assets. This is where I capture depreciation recapture amounts what I'm going to have to cover and the total of those assets um, that I'm going to have to pay depreciation recapture on. Okay. And so the sale of assets where section 179 was used or business use falls below 50%. We may is where part four occurs. And sometimes we may have some assets that are used for personal purposes as well as for business, or we make a change in an asset and how it's owned. And so we, we may need to kind of watch for that. And this can get relatively complicated um, from time to time. And that's why we usually recommend using a professional to go through some of these things. So, for example, I sell a tractor for $20,000. The assumption is that tractor was written off using Section 179 as the, you know, at purchase, leaving a zero tax basis in that. And so whether I sell the tractor outright or I trade it in towards another piece of equipment, all $20,000 of that tractor is going to be taxed at ordinary income, not subject to self-employment tax. This gets reported on Form 4797 under Part 4. Okay, if other depreciation methods was used, uh, that gets also reported on 4797, except it's going to go in on, under Part 3. So here are the capital gains rate I discussed just a few moments ago. The break points are 0%, 15%, 20%. Okay. And um, this is set statutory dollar amounts adjusted for inflation, and it's adjusted annually for inflation rates. 
And so what this means is the following. This is a, a taxable, this is the brackets used for cap gains in 2023, for 2023. 2022, these limitations and upper levels were a little bit different. So if you are married filing jointly, and um, let's say my taxable income from ordinary income and other sources was only $80,000. And then I sell something for $10,000, all right? The first $9,250 of that $10,000 sale, all right? If I made money on it, and if this is a profit to me type idea, all right? I'm long-term cap gains. That first $9,250 is going to be taxed at a tax rate of 0%, while approximately $750 is going to be taxed at 15%, okay? And so these numbers will change from year to year. All right, with that, we've got some resource links, and I'm, I'm hoping that Olivia will share this, these PowerPoints with everybody so that they, they can access, uh, y'all can access some of these resources. I would strongly encourage you to, to review some of those resources. Um, contact information, which I know Olivia has put into the chat. And with that, um, Olivia, any questions? That was very, relatively quick. Um, I kind of quickly moved through a couple of things because Rob kind of talked about it in his section, which was good. Um, we can get yeah. pretty into the weeds on this stuff and, and given the time limitations, this is, this is really the true 10,000 foot value, not to mention we start going into the weeds and we do it really fast. Everybody's eyes just start spinning and we're like the little doggy in the back of the window, just our heads bouncing up and down. And so, um, but well, I think you made it pretty accessible to reach us out. Three of you. Yeah, yeah. And and just as a reminder, um, the slides will be up on the Mighty Networks platform and you all will receive them as an attachment tomorrow as well. Um, tomorrow or then, you know, in the next couple of days, we'll do a follow up email. And um, I'm just going to put our little survey here back in the chat with our conference incentive as well. So. Um, that was great, y'all. I think you made some really challenging material very accessible. I encourage everybody to reach out to these folks with questions in your day-to-day -day application of these concepts. And um, yeah, JC and Rob and Adam, thank you so much. And you know, last last little piece of information for everybody is our next webinar is going to be on June nineteenth. Um, we're diving into access to capital topics in the next two months. And our first one is about traditional lenders and the FSA. And we actually have FSA Administrator Zach Ducheneau leading that webinar, which we're very excited. So there's a little reminder about what that looks like and our folks that will be um, presenting in, in June. So thanks everybody for joining us. And we hope to keep seeing you here at... Uh, our meat to market webinars and thanks to our educators. Thanks for having us. Yes, thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you. And everybody, please feel free to, to make contact with us if you have questions and want to talk through something. Thanks, Al.